Okay, it's two o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to everybody who has logged in. Um, this is the first of what may be a three part lecture series on shock and trauma. Uh, today, basically, we're going to just start talking about uh, the differences in the types of shock and just really kind of lay the groundwork. So just so everybody knows, I have no financial disclosures, there are no conflicts of interest. Um, and so I kind of want to start with a, a quick question, is what kind of shock do you see in trauma? And I'm going to put a poll up. I'm hoping you guys can see it. You want to go ahead and answer. Okay, looks like most people have voted. And 100% everybody is agreeing that we do see, can you guys see results? That we see all of the types of shock in trauma. And so we see cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock a lot of times is presented as obstructive shock, especially early on. Obviously we see hypovolemic shock with our patients shoes in blood in the early stages of a trauma incident. And as the uh, care gets uh, more extended, may see water loss. We see distributive shock, whether that's neurogenic shock or septic shock, it could even be anaphylactic. And so really all of this is going to be within the preview of taking care of the trauma patient. And a lot of that is really gonna depend on the phase of care they're in. Obviously when you're in the emergency department, neurogenic shock and hemorrhagic shock are what we're gonna focus on. Uh, the OR, a lot more hemorrhagic shock as they're losing blood. And in the inpatient side, this is where we're really going to see a lot more of the distributive shock, maybe a potential sepsis, as well as your hypovolemic shock and um, your neurogenic shock. So it kind of goes across the spectrum of care. So like I said, this is going to be kind of a basic lecture to kind of lay our groundwork as we get more in depth in future lectures. And so I want to just really define what shock is. And when you really think about the true definition of shock, it's oxygen supply and demand. It's when your body is demanding more oxygen than, your, uh, than it can supply itself and leaving us in an anaerobic metabolism type of state. Now, oxygen, we all know we need oxygen and it's not just about breathing in and breathing out. Every cell in our body needs oxygen in order to grow and thrive and replicate. And at the very minimum, our cells need enough oxygen to just stay alive and not break down. Because shock is actually a cellular phenomenon. Shock is gonna start long before we see the signs and symptoms that we assess for. Now, I don't wanna like freak anybody out, but this means we also have to talk just very briefly about the Krebs cycle. Now, when we talk about the Krebs cycle, because shock is a cellular phenomenon, it truly does apply here. Because during the Krebs cycle, if you take this little molecule glucose, you give it all the oxygen it needs, supply meets demand, the Krebs cycle happens. And at the end of the Krebs cycle, we have enough ATP to fuel ourselves to keep us in aerobic metabolism. So our cells maintain, they're healthy, they can thrive, they can grow, they can replicate. Now, when something happens and that little molecule does not get the oxygen it meet, needs, uh, supply does not meet demand, we do not have the Krebs cycle. And the end result is that we only produce two ATP plus some lactic acid. And so when you're only get, your cells are only given two ATP for energy, they cannot do everything they need to. They're starving, they're hypoxic, um, and they're going to break down and we're going to see cell death. Because our ATP, ATP is our fuel of the cell, and we need it for that cell to stay uh, nice and happy and healthy. We don't have ATP or an anaerobic metabolism. Our sodium potassium pump is going to fall apart um, and that's going to result in cell death. Now, if you love the Krebs cycle, I know you love the sodium potassium pump. So let's talk that for just a second. So if we look at the integrity of a cell, everybody knows these numbers on the screen. It's what you get in your BMP. Your sodium is 140, your potassium normal is four, your chloride normal is 100, 
your bicarb is 24. But when we look at what these numbers look inside the cell, you see these numbers are incredibly different. Matter of fact, there's no 50-50 ratio any place within what your ions are inside the cell versus outside the cell. And so if that cell wall breaks down, bad things are gonna happen. That cell wall is gonna break down and our sodium, everything is gonna try, try to equilibrate. So that 140 outside the cell is gonna move inside the cell. That 135 of potassium that's inside the cell is gonna move outside. It's gonna try to make itself balanced, so a 50-50 ratio. And we know when potassium goes high in our extracellular, when our BMP and our potassium gets to eight or nine, bad things are gonna happen. We're going to uh, have some cardiac issues. And we're gonna have some you know, peak T waves and some really just ugly EKGs. We also know that if sodium drops, especially if it drops rapidly in your BMP, you get all of a sudden you have a sodium of 120, now we're at high uh, incidence for seizures. And so maintaining that cellular integrity is gonna be really important. So our goal as, as nurses, as we're taking care of our patients, is really to maximize our oxygen supply. And there's five ways we can do that. We can do it ma maintaining ventilation, maintaining oxygenation, making sure our patients have enough hemoglobin to carry oxygen, that their cardiac output is good, and that once the cell oxygen reaches the tissues, our tissues are at a place in which they can use the oxygen that it, it uh, gets. So I'm gonna break this down really quickly before we really jump into all of the different types of shock because this is kind of an important first step. So the five steps, our first one is pulmonary ventilation. That's really easy. Air goes in, air comes out. Lots of ways that we can measure ventilation. The best way to measure ventilation though is by just good old clinical assessment. Now outside of clinical assessment, we can do end titles, which could either be on a ventilated patient or we can do it through a nasal cannula. And then of course, if you wanna draw a blood gas, whether it's arterial venous, that'll give you your PaCO2 in order to measure ventilation. Now we also have to, you'd be remiss that if you talk about oxygenation and ventilation, that we always say that they are not the same thing. And we can't assume that a good pulse ox saturation means our child is well ventilated. Now interventions we're gonna to use to combat ventilation issues, things like turning, pulmonary toileting, getting them up walking, uh, drug therapy, most likely Narcan. I mean, if you have a patient in pain, um, we give them a little bit of morphine, um, that's great. But if we give them a lot of morphine, what happens to our ventilation? It kind of depresses. And so you might need a little more Narcan. And the same thing is when we decide to give them morphine, maybe they're in too much pain, can't take a good deep breath. So that morphine would be, or fentanyl or whatever you're using would be an intervention to combat the ventilation. Now, as far as our trauma patients, they have problems with ventilation for some very specific reasons. We have kids with rib fractures, and if you've ever had a fractured rib, you know how much it hurts to take a deep breath, so they're gonna be taking shallow breaths. We have patients with spinal cord injuries, high spinal cord injuries. Um, if you're above C4, you're not gonna be able to inter, uh, uh, move your diaphragm up and down. It's gonna affect your ventilation. Our patients can get pneumonia. And of course, then just like we talked about the fact that we're using opioid analgesics, which could decrease our uh, uh, ability to take a good deep breath. Now, step two in making sure our patients get enough oxygen to keep those cells alive is oxygenation. And it's really the diffusion of oxygen going from the lung into the pulmonary circuit and how that can diffuse through. And there's reasons for our trauma patients that they're not oxygenating very well. And the first one is our trauma patients, especially in the pediatric arena, we see a lot of pulmonary contusions. Or as you can see on this lung, you can see all those boggy areas. Those are places in which we have contusions. And with the bruising of the lung, you're not gonna get oxygen. Um, it's gonna be hard for the oxygen to escape that alveoli and get into the pulmonary circuit. And so it'll affect our oxygenation. We have patients with pulmonary edema. We have inhalation injuries. And then of course we may have patients in ARDS, all that will affect our oxygenation and getting oxygen to our kids. And finally, we may have a patient with a pulmonary or a fat embolus. Now to assess our oxygenation, again, we're gonna do good clinical assessment. You know, look around their mouth. Are they nice and pink? Uh, do they look well perfused? Uh, we have our pulse ox. 
Not a huge fan of the pulse ox, but it does help us with some trends. So uh, I just always say when it comes to a pulse ox, buyer beware. Uh, if you do a blood gas, we can measure our PaO2. And then, of course, we can use a parameter to assess oxygenation, and that's through the AA gradient. The AA gradient, the big A is the alveolar wall, and the little a is the arterial circulation. And what our AA gradients allow us to do is look at what gets from the lungs into the arterial system. It's kind of that relationship. So it's not an exact number, um, but it does help us measure simple diffusion. Now, if we want to talk about simple diffusion of what, what our lungs can do and the oxygen that gets into our lungs on anybody with normal lungs. So hopefully all of us that are on the call, we have nice normal lungs. And so you take whatever it is you're breathing in, oxygen-wise, times five. And that should tell you what your PaO2 is or your, or your expected diffusion. So all of us are on 21%. So our PaO2s are probably in the low 100s. If I put somebody with normal lungs on 50%, they're gonna have a PaO2 of 250. But now these are normal healthy lungs in which our patient with a pulmonary contusion isn't gonna have. And so if I wanna look at somebody with not healthy lungs or injured lungs, we can look at a PF ratio to look at our oxygenation ability. The PF ratio is really kind of cool because it doesn't matter if you're on oxygen, it doesn't matter if you're on a ventilator or you're on room air, um, the number, the ratio kind of stays the same and can translate meaning, meaning no matter what's going on with your patient or what unit you're on. And it's truly an assessment of oxygenation despite the injury and despite what your oxygen or your FiO2 is. Now, it will require to do some pretty simple math. Um, and if you're like me, if you want to do two divided by two, you're taking your calculator out. So I always use a calculator to do a PaO2 or PF ratio. Now what we're doing here is we're taking our PaO2, so you would need to get a blood gas, divided by your FiO2. And that's gonna tell us, are we having issues with oxygenation or, and is our patient an ARDS? If I do a PaO2 divided by FiO2 and I'm over 475, I have normal lungs, we're oxygenating fine. You can see a PF ratio between two and 300 is mild ARDS, 100 to 200 is moderate, and less than 100 where we have a patient with severe ARDS. Here's kind of an example of a patient that we'd be looking at this with. You have a 12 year old who's in a motor vehicle crash. He comes in with pulmonary contusion and rib fractures. He gets intubated and the team now is weaning to extubate. At 10 o'clock at night, you can see he's on 40%. His PaO2 is 158, his PCO2 is 36. Um, he has good clinical assessment. He's uh, over breathing the vent. He has good chest rise and his lung sounds clear. If we did a PF ratio, that would be taking your PaO2, 158, divided by 40%, and you get a PF ratio at 395. Now, that's not that 450 that we said was normal, but we know we have a patient with a pulmonary contusion, and because he has that bruise on the lung, we can't expect it to be normal. However, it's not too bad. So the team decides to wean his FiO2 to 30, and they decrease his rate, getting ready for extubation. In the morning, um, he still has good chest rise. He still has good breath sounds. You can see he's on 30% and his blood gas comes back with a PaO2 of 90. So we take 90 divided by 30 and our PF ratio, it's dropped to 300. Now we still have that bruise or contusion on the lung, so we don't have a normal lung, but we've dropped 95 points, which is telling you that there is a problem with our oxygenation. We're going the wrong way. Something's wrong. Now, if I didn't do this PF ratio, I might look at this gas, this PO2, and the fact that it doesn't look too bad. And so that's what happens, and the team proceeds to extubate, and now they put this patient on a 70% face mask. At 9 a.m., we get another blood gas on 70%. PO2 is 92. We do the math, his PF ratio has now fallen to 131. Remember, at 6 a.m. it was 300, at 10 o'clock last night it was 395. Remember, normal's 475. We are at 131, we are in moderate ARDS. Even though you have a PaO2 of 92, which by itself doesn't look too bad, but when you look at the trend, we know we have a patient in trouble. So, what would you do to increase the oxygenation? And I'm gonna pop this poll up. Um, how do I get to the next 
full sitting. Today, I only have the last poll. I can pull it up. Could you? Okay. There we go. Okay, let me pull it on. All right. So I have a patient that I need to increase his oxygenation. You need to increase his diffusion. Do I want to encourage deep breathing, change to a non rebreather, give him a nebulizer treatment? or nothing, a PF ratio of 131 is absolutely fine. Okay, I'm gonna give a couple more seconds and I'll share results so far. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share. This was a little bit of a tough question because I gave you two that were really probably both right. Um, as far as diffusion, what we really wanna do is encourage that deep breathing. We really wanna open up the alveoli and get them breathing. Now, is it wrong to put them on a non-rebreather? Absolutely not. If you have a patient that is not oxygenating well, you are in ARDS, a non-rebreather is probably not a bad idea but it's all about what is our treatment that's gonna fix something. And that's probably going to be um, encouraged deep breathing. And other things we can do to open these patients up. If it's a baby, we can let them cry for a minute. Let's turn them, let's go do some deep breathing, get your incentive spirometer out, blow bubbles, blow bubbles in your milk, cough, get them up walking around, sit them on the side of the bed, anything we can do. And you have done all this, and with our patient, now we're able to drop his FiO2 to 50. Our next gas has a PaO2 of 96. And you can see the PF ratio is going up. And so good job. And at 1500, you can see his PaO2 has gone down, but so is his oxygen requirements. And so his PF ratio just keeps coming up. And that's that relationship that we see as we keep doing some of those nursing interventions. So as we translate this whole PF ratio thing to all units and all nurses that are gonna to be touching the trauma patient, what we really can do is a lot of proactive care, a lot of making sure our patients are turning, they're ambulating, um, they're hydrating. Um, we do good clinical assessment to make sure that we are always encouraging uh, the alveoli to stay open and to work. Now, other things that we can do to intervene if we have problems with oxygenation, if I have a patient with pulmonary edema, we give Lasix. If I have a patient with pneumonia, this is a patient who's gonna need antibiotics so the oxygen can diffuse past all of the muck that would be in the lungs. Um, we've already talked about a patient with atelectasis in which we can do some pulmonary toileting to encourage diffusion. And with the ARDS, we might have to add some PEEP and that could mean um, uh, potentially ventilating a patient. Our next step is hemoglobin availability. We can't oxygenate our tissues unless we have the hemoglobin that's gonna carry our oxygen. So what we're looking at is our H and H levels, our hemoglobin and our hematocrit. Just a little bit of trivia for you. This was kind of an aha moment to me once upon a time. If you take your hemoglobin and you times it by three, that's what your hematocrit is. And every time I get an H and H back, I always do this math and it's always right. So if you know one, you know the other. So normal hemoglobin, we're gonna say is 14 to 15. And we have to have that hemoglobin for the oxygen to bind onto and so it can be transported to the tissues because it can't oxygenate my tissues if it can't get there. The rule of thumb is to transfuse for a hemoglobin of greater than or equal to 70. If I give a 10 mil per kilo dose of packed red cells, it should increase my hemoglobin by two. And so that means if I have a patient with a hemoglobin of eight, it's gonna take three units of blood or three 10 per kilo boluses of blood in order for me to normalize to a normal hemoglobin. Now we, all, we don't necessarily always want to do that because we don't usually transfuse up to normal because of some of the issues with transfusion. Um, what do we do if we have a hemoglobin of seven? Um, 
do we always transfuse because we've, we're at seven or below seven? And it's the answer to that is not always. Uh, it needs to be a clinical assessment to dictate the need to transfuse because of that risk benefit. Now remember the pulse ox. The pulse ox measures hemoglobin um, saturation. And so if I have a hemoglobin of seven, my pulse ox is gonna be sitting there satin away at 100% because 100% of all my hemoglobin is saturated. It's much easier to totally saturate a hemoglobin of seven than it is to totally saturate a hemoglobin of 15. So your pulse ox is not necessarily the best piece of machine or the best, best machine to tell you how well your patient is oxygenating. Because oxygen content sometimes can be all about the hemoglobin and for that the intervention is really easy. Proactively, we can identify patients at risk for bleeding and stay on top of that and monitor them and catch it early if they do start bleeding. And we can monitor heart rate and neurologic status to uh, tell us if our hemoglobin is dropping. The hemoglobin dropping is going to give you a tachycardic patient who may have some altered mental status changes because they're not able to oxygenate their tissues as well, including their brain. And so signs and symptoms we will see. Um, Actually, I think that might be a poll, but we're going to skip that because I just gave you the answers. Uh, hemoglobin reactive care. So somebody's already bleeding. We didn't, get to, we didn't get the opportunity to catch it beforehand. And that's what we see a lot with trauma patients is we're going to do hemostasis and then transfuse. So stop the bleeding or slow the bleeding and then replace what the patient has lost. And so when we look at hemoglobin loss, it might be blood that we see on the floor but it also could be blood that we can't visualize. We could have a patient with a big abdomen, a big firm abdomen, and remember your abdomen can hold 100% of your total blood volume, so you can totally bleed out. Could be within a, a fractured femur. That fractured femur space can hold 60% of your blood volume. And if we have a pelvic injury, it can hold another 100% can hold 100 of your total blood volume. So these are places that are, are vulnerable, that we may not see the blood on the floor, but our patients are bleeding out. And our patients can compensate um, with fight flight and you know, vaso, or getting tachycardia, getting vasoconstricted until they lose about 25 to 30% of their total blood volume. Once you lose 25% of your total blood volume, your comp compensatory mechanisms start to fail. And that's where our patients then start to um, kind of circle the drain on us and we're not able to manage them as well. They start getting bradycardic, majorly hypotensive, and it gets much harder to pull them back. Step four of maximizing tissue oxygenation is cardiac output. And we don't tend to measure cardiac output, so we have to look and figure out how we know it's adequate. We don't usually have catheters such as these in our patients. We're not doing uh, cardiac ultrasounds all the time to look at our output. So it really is going to be about clinical assessment. And remember, cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. And your stroke volume is preload, afterload, and contractility. And all of that is very measurable. And I'm going to use for the rest of this lecture the anagram CRAP. If I can get it on here. CRAP. Contractility, rate, afterload, and preload. And let's be real. When you have a patient in shock, some of the first words that pop in your head are CRAP or a derivative, four-letter derivative of CRAP. And so it's kind of an easy... Uh, anagram to remember. So if we go back, let's talk about preload and afterload a little bit because it's not necessarily, we kind of all know what it is, but it's not lingo that we're using in everyday conversation. So if we talk about preload, preload is the volume of blood in the ventricles at the end of di diastole. So it's really the filling pressure. I always think of preload as how full is my heart, especially the right side of my heart. And if I have high preload, it means I'm fluid overloaded most likely, um, or I could have cardiac regurgitation or I'm in heart failure. And that's not something we often see in the early stages of trauma, but if we give a little too much volume to a patient, we might see hypervolemia in the later stages of a trauma patient. What we tend to see early on in our trauma patients is low preload. 
means they're hypovolemic or they have blood pooling in the lower extremity. And so if you come in with an injury in which you are bleeding out, um, you're going to be hypovolemic and your preload is going to be low. Afterload is the resistance that the left ventricle has to overcome in order to push blood into the circulatory system. Another way to discuss the afterload is systemic vascular resistance. It's how hard does that left ventricle have to push to get the blood out. We have a high afterload if we have hypertension or if we have vasoconstriction, and that's going to play an important role when we talk about the different forms of shock. We have low afterload, that's because we have a patient with a dilated vessels or vasodilatation. Now, if preload is low, the pediatric patient is not going to be able to increase their cardiac contractility to raise their stroke volume. As pediatric patients, they just don't have the ability to, um, their body doesn't have the ability to, uh, to change that contractility. So instead, our patients get tachycardic and they really start to vasoconstrict in order to keep that blood pressure up. When you look at those vessels, you can see that vasoconstriction is really a powerful mechanism in order to keep up your blood pressure and in order to make that afterload go high. How we assess cardiac output is, I say it's good old fashioned clinical assessment. I'm really interested in what your systolic blood pressure is. Do you have good peripheral pulses and what kind of distal perfusion? I always tell people that, you know, as soon as a patient rolls into the room, one of the first things I'm gonna do is put my hand on their pedal pulse. If you have a pedal pulse, you have really good perfusion. You have good cardiac output, and that gives me a lot of data. And our older kids and adults, our systolic blood pressure really is a good indicator of what our cardiac output is. But in our pediatric patients, our little patients who haven't had any atherosclerosis, we can really use those peripheral pulses because they're little, they're gonna have really good blood flow compared to somebody older who probably hasn't seen blood flow to those toes in 20 years. Now, has anybody ever had a pulse oximeter that ever that stopped picking up? Worked fine an hour ago, and now you can't pick it up for anything. And so what do we do? So the pulse ox isn't picking up, so I move it to another finger, right? And still isn't picking up, so maybe I change out the probe. Still isn't picking up, I move it to the toe. Well, have you ever stopped to wonder that your pulse ox isn't picking up, not because it's an equipment failure, but because our cardiac output has changed. I always love when people have a pulse ox that's not picking up and we go get a hot pack because all of a sudden their fingers have gotten cold. Well, why has their fingers gotten cold? Are their fingers cold because the room just got chilly or is their fingers cold because they don't, their cardiac output has changed? So it's always something to consider when we're looking at equipment. Now, the other things I'm gonna assess for cardiac, good cardiac output is, do I have good urinary uh, output? What does my skin look like? Am I, do I have nice, good pulses or am I mottled and cold? And what is my mental status? Am I confused? Am I perplexed? Is my patient disoriented? All of these things are going to give me a clue that I do not have good oxygenation. Urine output is, I'm not oxygenating my kidneys. Uh, the mottled skin is I'm vasoconstricted and I'm not getting end organ perfusion. And obviously the disorientation is going to be I'm not perfusing my brain very well. So things we can do to maximize our cardiac output, we can manipulate our heart rate, we can manipulate our intervascular volume, and we can improve our contractility. So we can manipulate that intervascular volume, we can give fluid, we can uh, to manipulate the heart rate, we can, uh, there's medications we can put, whether you're too fast, you're an SVT, we can give some medication to slow you down. We can give medication to speed you up and we can even use a uh, pacer if needed. Now, other issues with cardiac output is we have patients that'll get in trauma of patients that get um, tension pneumothorax or a cardiac tamponade. And this is part of your obstructive shock that we'll talk about later in which we have to relieve that tension, whether it's around the heart or the lungs, um, in order for us to maintain our cardiac output or resume or fix our cardiac output. So more on that in a few minutes. And finally is step five. This is tissue utilization. All the, everything else has worked. We've oxygenated, we've ventilated, we've plenty of hemoglobin, our cardiac output is good. 
oxygen has made it to the tissues. Now can the tissues actually use it um, when it's delivered? And there's three reasons that our tissues may not be able to use the oxygen we've delivered. One is too little oxygen is delivered, so increase your hemoglobin, increase your ventilation, increase your oxygen. Second is our demand is too high. That patient has a fever, they have a ton of injuries that are increasing oxygen demand, and so we have to uh, decrease their demand somehow. Or their cells are just unable to use the oxygen that we've delivered. Now, cells can't use oxygen we've delivered for a few reasons. One, there is a pulmonary, you know, there's a clot that it can't jump across to that cell. There is a bruise that it can't go through. Um, something is inhibiting the oxygen from diffusing into the cell. It can get to the cell, but the cells can't absorb it. And that'd be an example of something like cyanide toxicity. Or the cell has already died. The cell has died, we can keep delivering oxygen, but you're not gonna be able to bring it back. We can measure tissue oxygenation, and this is a little complex, but it does make sense in the end, by looking at uh, normal venous return. So our heart pushes out 100% oxygenated blood. That 100% oxygenated blood goes to your tissues. Normally, the tissues use 25% of what we've delivered, and that blood goes back to your heart 75% oxygenated. Now, that's great and it's wonderful if we have fancy equipment that tell us this. And when I worked in cardiac care, I had lines in that would give me these numbers. But in our trauma patients, we do not have this um, ability. So I do know that if it's low going back to the heart, it's because my hemoglobin is trying to fix the hypoxia. It recognizes that my tissues have a need and so the hemoglobin is releasing the oxygen and it's gonna come back, or then oxygen will come back to the heart uh, less oxygenated. If what's coming back to the heart is high, it's because the hemoglobin is holding on to oxygen, not recognizing that there's a need in the body. Now, since I can't measure that exactly, there are ways we can indirectly look at this. And it's a difference between looking at, are we in an aerobic or an anaerobic metabolism state? We can see that through our lactate level or by a pH or base deficit. If I have a lactate level that's greater than or equal to four, um, then I'm in an anaerobic level, and anaerobic metabolism, and I'm not getting enough oxygen to my tissues. My pH is less than seven or my base deficit is greater than minus six, the same thing. Um, I'm in an anaerobic metabolism state and my tissues aren't getting oxygen. So that's the way we can measure this when we don't have the fancy equipment. Now, we used to think that vital signs and clinical assessment returned to normal. That meant our patients were done, we're fine. We've resuscitated them, everything is good. But your lactate, your pH, and your base deficit might tell us differently. Specifically, that lactate. That lactate, to me, is a marker of anaerobic metabolism. So if I have a high lactate level, it means that I have tissue hypoxia the only way to really get a high lactate level. And as long as that lactate level stays high, then at the cellular level, our patients are still shocky, even though they may look fine, their vital signs may be fine, because sh shock starts and stops in the cell. And just like we can't see it with signs and symptoms when it starts, we can't necessarily tell it's over until we look at some of those labs. So resuscitation is over when vital signs and assessment are normal, as well as your aerobic metabolism returns. And you have that lactate that's less than four. You have a pH that's greater than 7.30. Now interventions for uh, tissue utilization is depending on the underlying cause. If there's too little oxygen delivered, then we need to increase delivery. We need to either give them some oxygen, we need to improve their ventilation, maybe they need some blood to increase their hemoglobin some fluid in order to increase that cardiac output. If demand is too high, decrease the demand. If they have a fever, let's bring it down. If they're in pain, we need to give pain medication. Um, and if the cells are dead or dying, there's really not much we're gonna be able to do. So it's gonna be important to catch it before it's too late. Now taking that basis that we've just talked about, I wanna now go into identifying some of the different types of shock that our trauma patients are going to see. And we talked about the acronym CRAP, contractility rate after load and preload. 
But let's go through that just really quick because it's going to come back to haunt you in every single one of our uh, types of shock we're going to talk about. So contractility, strength and vigor of the contracture during systole. How, how, how much oomph does your heart have? And you can think about it with Starling's law. And this is Starling's law is the heart will eject a greater stroke volume at greater filling pressures. So the more full the heart is, the better it's going to contract. It's kind of like a rubber band. The more I pull the rubber band, the, more, the harder it's going to snap back. Signs and symptoms of poor contactility, fatigue, altered mental status, cool model peripheries, delayed cap refill, hypotension, tachycardia, leading to bradycardia, thready pulses, raised jugular venous pressure, breathlessness, hypoxemia. It really all comes back to what we've already talked about. It's coming back to mental status, heart rate, pulses, uh, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and that end organ ability. Am I able to make urine? Am I able to mentate? And so all that can give you an idea that you have a problem with contractility. We look at rate. That's pretty easy. Everybody knows basic heart rate. We're really good at assessing it. And we, it really comes down to us knowing our pediatric norms and identification of our current rate and how the patient is trending. Are they slowly trending to being more and more tachycardic? And if so, identifying that trend before it uh, comes out of control. And then when we go to afterload, remember it's how hard that left ventricle has to work in order to open that aortic valve and push the blood out of the heart. Remember another name for it is systemic vascular resistance. We're gonna measure afterload really using your diastolic pressure and your end organ per, uh, perfusion. So when I look at afterload, if I'm vasoconstricted, I have a high afterload. If I'm vasoconstricted, my heart's gonna have to push really hard to get the blood out. And so my diastolic pressure is gonna be high. If I um, have vasoconstriction, I have cool mottled skin. I have low urine output because uh, oxygen is getting those kidneys very well and an altered mental status. If I'm vasodilated, meaning I have a low afterload, um, my heart's not gonna have to push very hard. So my diastolic pressure is gonna be low. We're gonna have patients with orthostatic hypotension. They get up to go to the bathroom and get woozy may even fall out on you. They're tachycardic and they can be flushed. And finally, we go to preload. Remember, it's that, how full is your heart? It's the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. And it's the amount of ventricular stretch at the end of diastole. Um, or the better way to pull it, put it is the, the heart is loading up for the next big squeeze of the ventricles during systole. And so I always had, I used to work with a cardiac surgeon and he would never ask what preload is or what my uh, right atrial pressure was. He would always ask what's the filling pressure. So I always think of filling pressure when I think of preload and how full of, the, how full of blood is my heart that's gonna get squeezed out um, when the heart beats the next time. If I have an empty heart, if I have low preload, I have poor peripheral heart pulses, we're hypotensive, we may have some venous pooling and we have poor oxygenation. If my heart is overfilled, uh, pulmonary congestion will have high blood pressure and you may see some edema. All right, when we think of trauma, the first type of shock that we think of is hypovolemic shock, specifically hemorrhagic shock. And these are because our kids come in and they're bleeding. Other types of patients with hemorrhagic shock that we may see other than trauma patients, um, and hopefully we don't see too many OB patients, but they're another subset. We also see kids with GI bleed and uh, bleeding disorders that could come in or at some point develop hemorrhagic shock. You develop hemorrhagic shock when you've lost greater than 25% of that total blood volume. That's when you start decompensating in hemorrhagic shock. Now, hemorrhagic shock falls under the heading of hypovolemic shock. And so we can have water loss um, instead of blood loss. These are types of, in our trauma patients, this is the type of shock we're going to see a little bit later after they've left the trauma bay, probably after that first 24 hours. Um, these are our patients, maybe they have a GI ileus and are vomiting, and so they have GI losses. Our burn patients tend to be hypovolemic shock versus hemorrhagic shock. And then we have some patients that just have so many insensible losses, whether it's from you know, the NG putting out a lot, We've given them some Lasix and they've responded really well. They're sweating, they're shivering, and we can lose water that way. 
Now the signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock from water loss versus blood are pretty much the same. And if we look at them using the acronym CRAP, your hypovolemic shock patient is gonna have high contractility, they're gonna be tachycardic, their heart is gonna be empty, so they have uh, low, low preload, sorry, I made a mistake there. And they're gonna have a uh, high afterload. I switched those two up, I'll have to fix that. So the preload is high because their uh, the preload is low because their heart is empty. They're bleeding all that blood out. Their afterload is high because we have vasoconstriction in order uh, to maintain our blood pressure. And so for hypovolemic shock, we really look at our patients, they go into fight flight. So that sympathetic nervous system takes over, it releases a lot of adrenaline. They have major vasoconstriction, they're tachycardic. The heart becomes very uh, uh, proficient at contracting with a lot of oomph. They're breathing fast, their pupils dilate, they become hyperglycemic, and just every tissue oxygen need we have increases. Because of that vasoconstriction, this is where we see the end organ hypoperfusion. We get really mottled, we have low urine output, and we might have patients that are confused or um, have altered mental status. Now, a compensated hypo patient in hypovolemic shock is going to be tachycardic. They're going to have poor peripheral pulses, maybe even absent peripheral pulses, but they will have central pulses. They'll have a normal systolic blood pressure, and it, be, it stays normal because of the tachycardia and the vasoconstriction. It's keeping our systolic blood pressure at a normal. And then, of course, you'll see the high diastolic pressure because of the high afterload. Our patients start breathing a lot in order to uh, compensate for their acidosis. They have the low urine output. They may be normal to confused, and their extremities may be normal to cool plus or minus modeling. When we get to uncompensated shock, this is when our patients lose more than 25 to 30 percent of their volume. This is when we start seeing extreme tachycardia that then becomes bradycardia. Their systolic blood pressure starts to drop. We don't have any peripheral pulses and our, dis our central pulses now are starting to get thready. Our extremities are cold and mottled and our urine output is very oleoguric to anuric and our uh, mental status becomes uptunded, goes from kind of being incredibly agitated to the uptunded state. Now treatment is where hypovolemic shock varies on water loss versus blood loss. But the overall goal is we need to make sure we fill the vasculature back up, fill that heart, increase our preload, and decrease our afterload. And so if I just have water loss, it's all about just filling that tank. And we can do that with a crystalloid such as LR, or we can use plasma if you'd like to use a colloid. And there's a lot of advantages to using colloids over crystalloids um, in some of the recent literature that looks at um, Basically, the use of crystalloids, it's going to enhance your inflammatory response, which kind of leads to bad signs and symptoms. And we see that the use of colloids, such as FFP, um, does not act on that uh, uh, SIRS-type picture as much. And so if I have a two-year-old with gastritis times three days, he has vomiting and diarrhea, he has a heart rate of 200, no peripheral pulses, weak central pulses, blood pressure of 50 over 38, the best treatment I can probably give this patient is 20 per kilo of normal saline or LR or plasma in order to fill the tank. H&H &H is probably fine, so the need for blood or um, other yellow products for coagulopathy are probably not needed. Now we give that 20 per kilo bolus of normal saline and his vital signs don't improve, but they're not worse. So the next thing we could do is we could repeat the bolus. We could give a 10 per kilo bolus of blood. We could give a code dose of epinephrine. Now this is where people sometimes get into trouble. Um, the right answer here is really to go ahead and repeat that bolus. Because remember, the problem is that our patient is dry. Some of you may be asking, why not give epi? Well, epinephrine is a vasoconstrictor. And it works by increasing your blood pressure by increasing afterload. And if I'm in hypovolemic shock, my vessels are already constricted because I'm in that fight flight. My afterload is already high. And so what I need is not more vasoconstriction. I need more volume. 
And so in hypovolemic shock, epinephrine is somewhat useless until you can fill that tank back up. Now, if I have a patient who's bleeding, they're in hemorrhagic shock. First goal is always to stop the bleeding, hemostasis first. And so we can stop the bleeding in several ways. If it's external bleeding, we can put pressure or a tourniquet. If it's pelvic bleeding, I might want to put a pelvic binder on or some way re, uh, push that pelvis together. Put on warm blankets. And we may even need to go to surgical control in order to stop the hemorrhage. And I want to back up to the fact that I said warm blankets will stop bleeding. Um, we use warm blankets in heat and trauma, not because we want to make our patients comfortable. But the literature out there supports that increasing a patient's temperature up to normal increases oxygenation, and it also will assist in hemorrhage control. And we see that if you ever looked at what I refer to the trauma triad of death, is when you get a traumatic injury, you start by losing a lot of blood. And when you lose a lot of blood, you immediately become cold and your body temperature drops and become hypothermic. At the same time, you become coagulopathic and you become acidotic. I cannot fix my coagulopathy problem and I cannot reverse my acidosis until my patient is warm. And so when, you come, when we talk about bleeding and stopping the bleed, you have to have a warm patient to do so. And the nice part about that is that is something that's very amenable to nursing. Is that something we can fix and we can fix without anybody being there to tell us to do it. Um, and so here we see we become acidotic because we have that increased acidosis, that increased lactic acid because we're in an anaerobic state. And also because we're acidotic, it decreases our heart's performance, um, which then um, makes us coagulopathic. Now, blood products. When we have a patient in hemorrhagic shock, we want to replace whatever the body is losing. So for me to give them normal saline, that's not what my body is losing. My body is losing whole blood. And so I need to replace blood components to mimic whole blood. And so we always start with packed red cells because that increases our oxygenation by increasing our hemoglobin. Kind of goes back to where we started this lecture. Um, we'll give plasma, it's a great volume expander that's also gonna improve our clotting function. And starting with these two things up, set us up for really initiating a massive blood transfusion protocol. Now what we need to keep in mind with massive blood transfusion protocol in somebody with hemorrhagic shock is it's important that we maintain the balance. We need to have equal administration of packed red cells, plasma, and platelets. And often where we get in trouble is our, our massive blood transfusion protocol starts with just red cells. And that's purposeful because we want to increase the oxygen, but we've got to be quick to getting that yellow product into our patients, that plasma and platelets. Because otherwise, if we just give all PAC cells, our oxygen, our hemoglobin carrying capacity is going to be great, but our, we're going to be incredibly coagulopathic because we've diluted all that out. Now, here's the problem with that, and I'm not, I think everybody on this call is probably aware of it, is that plasma is frozen and it takes about 17 minutes before um, it can be released to get it to the bedside. Um, I'm aware of that, we're all aware of that, and the blood bank is working now actively on trying to rectify that and having uh, either fresh or thawed plasma going to be available to us, hopefully sooner in the future than later. Now, like I said before, I'm not a fan of normal saline when it comes to hemorrhagic shock because it increases that inflammatory response. The other thing that's going to happen, if I give you multiple boluses of sodium chloride or LR, it's going to dilute my blood volume. It's going to cause my hemoglobin to drop because I'm going to dilute it out. I'm going to dilute out all of my uh, coag factors, so my PT-PTT is going to go higher and my platelet levels are gonna drop. And it's not because I'm losing them, it's because I'm diluting everything out. And then there's always, like I said, the talk about epi. With hemorrhagic shock, again, if you are having blood pressure problems, it's not because you're vasoconstricted, it is because or you're already vasoconstricted, so epi's not gonna really be that helpful. It's, already, it's all about in, uh, maintaining your volumes. Now that takes us to distributive shocks, and there's three types of distributive shock that a, a trauma patient can have all three of them. Um, we can have septic shock, we can have anaphylactic shock, 
or we can have uh, neurogenic shock. All these distributed shock, it comes down to vasodilatation. And here you can see a normal vessel before, before distributed shock hits, and then after it hits, it totally dilates out. And so sepsis and anaphylaxis, we have vasodilatation, which causes us to have poor cardiac output, meaning there's just not enough blood to fill up that expanded vasculature. And if we go back to crap, our contractility is going to be low, our rate is going to be high, we're going to be tachycardic, our afterload is low because we're vasodilated, so it's really easy for the heart to push out blood. And our preload is low because we have all that capillary leaking um, and our heart is just not full. And so again, we need to fill the tank. And we can do so with these types of shocks, usually with crystalloid or a colloid such as um, FFP. With septic shock, we're going to get tachycardic. We're going to have that increased work of breathing. There's capillary leaking. Uh, patients will have a high white count and they'll be coagulopathic. And sepsis becomes sepsis, septic shock when a patient becomes unresponsive to fluid. And so we're going to need to fill the tank with 30 mils per kilo lactate levels. This is basically that septic shock bundle that everybody is very aware about of, and it's really important to do it within the first hour. Now, anaphylactic shock, we don't see a lot, but we could um, with the trauma patient. Uh, same thing with, as with septic shock. They're going to become tachycardic increased work of breathing. Here we may see some strider due to that swelling of the tongue. We'll have that same vasodilatation in hives. Treatment, fluid, um, epi in order to uh, strengthen up that, that vasoconstrict, or to vasoconstrict that vasodilatation, and we'll protect the airway, and later treatment would be antihistamines and steroids. Now the final uh, type of distributive shock is your neurogenic shock. These are high spinal cord injuries of kids um, that have an injury above T6. And they lose that flight flight response and that parasympathetic takes over. So you can see here that neurogenic shock when we use CRAP, low contractility, low rate, low afterload, and low preload because it's just the parasympathetic taking over, which means they not only have a low heart rate, but they definitely become bradycardic. And so you can see here the difference between your sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, system. And remember, with neurogenic, sympathetic is totally gone. So all you have is parasympathetic running the show. Now, neurogenic shock effects on the cardiac, out, um, cardiac output. So crap, again, low, 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 and low. So you will have vasodilatation, which means you have a low diastolic blood pressure. Your preload is low because you have vascular, uh, vascular pooling. That blood just can't even get back up to the heart. And so what we're going to do with neurogenic shock is, again, we're going to fill the heart. And we may need to do something to increase the rate. And it may be as severe as pacing. Treatment is to closely want, monitor that blood pressure, that orthostatic hypotension. And it may take a long time to resolve this type of shock. And what we see in some kids with bad neurogenic shock is some of those symptoms never resolve and they always have a problem with orthostatic hypotension. And finally, cardiac shock and trauma, it's mainly obstructive. Most of our patients are nice and healthy and they have good hearts. And so it's very rare that we're going to see heart failure um, in any type of pediatric trauma patient. So what we're gonna look at is pulmonary embolism, cardiac tamponade, and tension pneumothorax. Now, Obstructive shock, let's look at, this is crap spelled out for everybody. And I, like I said, I will fix that at, uh, hypovolemia. But with obstructive shock, you have a low contractility, a high rate, high afterload, and low preload. The overall goal of care with anything obstructive is to relieve the obstruction. So with pulmonary embolism, if we have a sudden blockage of the main artery in the lung, that's actually not often fatal in kids, but it can cause a lot of blood damage. What we're going to see with the pulmonary embolism is a pretty sudden shortness of breath that just kind of comes on without uh, warning, some chest pains, and it may be worse with deep breathing or coughing, and we may or may not see that pink foamy mucus. Our patients are also probably be tachycardic. They'll be anxious because they're not oxygenating well, sweating, having palpitations, so you may see some fainting. Uh, diagnosis, we can do lab work, we can do a chest x-ray, get a chest CT. Uh, they usually will order a CT pulmonary angiogram or a pulmonary angiogram to really get a good look at that vasculature. We could look at ultrasound or a BQ scan. Treatment is going to be supportive, um, non-invasive. If possible, we'll put them on anti anticoagulant therapy. 
However, if our patients are already coagulopathic or if they have a head bleed, this may be something that we're not gonna be able to do for a few days or up to a week or so um, before, uh, uh, while we're waiting for that to get better. Invasively, they could go in and do a surgical clot removal. We may see our uh, patients, especially our penetrating injury patients, come in with a, and have a cardiac tamponade. This is where fluid builds up within that pericardial sac, and that pericardial sac is not elastic at all, and so it doesn't hold much. Matter of fact, it can only hold about 25 cc's of blood before it really um, messes things up. And like I said, we usually see this in penetrating trauma. Signs and symptoms are Beck's triad. We're gonna have a muffled heart sound because we're listening to that lub dub between all the blood. You'll have distended jugular veins and a decreased systolic blood pressure. Um, and obviously our patients will be tachycardic to boot. Um, ETLS tells us that we need to go to the OR for definitive care. However, emergently we could do a pericardiocentesis in the code room or in the ICU, wherever you're at. And then finally, we have tension pneumothorax. This is a life-threatening condition um, that will not resolve itself. Air is gonna be trapped in that pleural cavity under positive pressure. And the most vulnerable time for a patient to blow a, a tension pneumo is the first time we introduce positive pressure ventilation. So the first time we put that bag on their face in order to um, uh, ventilate them. And what's happening here, it, it displaces all your mediastinal structures. So your trachea, your heart, everything gets shifted pushed over by wet tension pneumothorax and that air building up um, in the pulmonary bed. So what we'll see is a sharp shortness of breath, they'll have chest pains, they'll have trouble breathing, they'll have shallow breathing, contractility will be poor, they're gonna get tachycardic, your afterload is high, your preload is low, and we may or may not see a jugular vein distension. Patients at risk for this are gonna be, like I said, the first time we have positive pressure breath, watch for attention pneumothorax. Anybody on a PEEP, a high PEEP, I usually say a PEEP higher than 10. I'm keep, keeping my eyes open. Somebody with a pulmonary injury in which the, um, the bed is already injured. Uh, no time for imaging. We, it's, it's a clinical diagnosis. And um, what we're going to have clinically is no breast sounds on the affected side, decrease or no breast sounds on the unaffected side, depending on how much the, the affected side has shifted everything and majorly increase respiratory effort. So the treatment is to pop that balloon and we may do it with a needle and followed by a chest tube insertion. So what we've just started here is looking at the fact that if we understand the overall principles of shock and how to keep the tissues oxygenated and we can recognize signs and symptoms of shock, then we're gonna be able to see this and treat this much faster in our patients that we take care of. Because I love this picture you may not be an expert, but you gotta make sure your head's on, or gotta make sure you know what you're treating before you start the treatment. Um, coming soon, just so everybody's aware, um, the next lecture we're working on is taking these types of shock and trauma patients and expanding on them. And so hopefully coming soon, I'll have a, a more in-depth talk just on hemorrhagic shock, and that will be followed with a talk on neurogenic shock. And so we'll kind of keep this, keep this dialogue open. Um, at this point, I have to apologize. I only have about two minutes for questions. Um, but I also I want to- I gave everyone your email. Oh, great. Um, email me. Yep. And the eval is going to be in the chat section that Cindy has put up that you can find. And make sure you're attached to a computer when you do that evaluation. Um, that way you can print out your evals. Anything else, Cindy? No, uh, lots of positive comments. Great. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. I really apologize that I didn't leave enough time for questions. Um, I just talk too much sometimes. So I'll, no, don't to self for improvement. But I hope to see everybody return as we go in more into depth on the different types of shock. And we will have those dates out to you soon. Um, have a good day and talk soon.